It only makes sense to begin this series with the ancient Greeks, not because they supposedly invented theater, the Egyptians may have had them beat by a few centuries, but because the roots of Greek theater are tangled up with the vines that cultivated wine for the celebrations of the god Dionysus. And if you know anything about Dionysus, you probably know that he was the ancient Greek god celebrated as a partier a god of revelry and debauchery due to his association with all things vino. It should come as no surprise that Dionysus is the god of theater since Greek festivals and their celebratory methods, a.k.a. alcohol, provided an opportunity for reflection on oneself and one's relation to society. In fact, the combination of drinking and social reflection was an important aspect of one of ancient Greece's most celebrated pastimes, the Symposium. In the 4th and 5th centuries BCE, groups of Greek men would gather together to drink wine diluted with water, relax, tell stories, sing songs, and enjoy each other's company. But each symposium began with everyone reaching for a glass of wine before it was diluted and offering it to the god of their merriment, Dionysus. The drinking provided the reason to gather together. As Christopher Cook, Helen Tarbett, and David Ball point out, Moderate drinking was understood as facilitating conversation, which was supposed to predominate over drinking. But that is not to say that drinking did not say, take some preeminence sometimes. The symposium even provided the perfect dramatic setting for some early Greek plays in the surviving fragment of a fourth century comedy attributed to the playwright Eubulus, there is a description of the effects of a symposium listed according to each successive serving of wine, known as a crater. I mix three craters only for those who are wise. One is for good health, which they drink first. The second is for love and pleasure. The third is for sleep. And when they have drunk it, those who are wise wander homewards. The fourth is no longer ours, but belongs to arrogance. The fifth leads to shouting. The sixth to a drunken revel. The seventh to black eyes. The eighth to a summons the ninth to bile, the tenth to madness, in that it makes people throw things. <laughs> Clearly the Greeks knew how to throw a party. <laughs> Eubulus' description of wine culture in ancient Greece isn't unique. Other Greek playwrights, including the famous tragedian Euripides, explored the mind-altering experiences brought about by wine. In his play, The Bacchae, Euripides explores how Dionysus can lead people to madness and inhuman acts. And it's this connection between the god of wine and theater that is so interesting, because celebrations of Dionysus in ancient Greece provided the likely impetus for the formation of drama. So let's raise a glass of the finest vintage as we explore how wine culture helped give birth to theater. But before we move on to talk more about how ancient Greek wine culture and theater were intertwined, we have to talk about the wines themselves. According to wine expert Madeleine Paquette, wines in ancient Greece came in white and black, meaning red, varietals, with flavor descriptions that ranged from sweet to dry to sour. Homer mentions a sweet black wine from northern Greece, or Thrace. Aristotle spoke of wines from the islands of Lemnos as having the aroma of oregano and thyme. In fact, as Paquette explains, the Lemnio grape that still grows on the island is one of the oldest varietals in all of Greece. The connection between wine and ancient Greece is so well attested in the historical record that the relationship has its own Wikipedia page, which I highly recommend you check out. But this video is about wine and theater, and in order to untangle that relationship, we have to start by examining the festivals dedicated to Dionysus and his favorite pastime, consuming copious amounts of wine. Attributions to Dionysus in written sources go as far back as ancient Mycenaean Greece in the late Bronze Age. And even back then, his association with wine culture seems strong. But for our purposes, we're going to zoom in on the Attic Peninsula in Greece from the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. 
At that time, the city of Eleutherii was well known in Greece as the host city for Dionysus and regularly celebrated their patron deity with a festival called the Rural Dionysia. The Rural Dionysia was held during the planting month of Poseidon, roughly late December and into January, where processions of boys, girls, and groups of dancers eventually led to a competition of choral odes dedicated to the god. These choral odes were called dithrams and usually involved about 50 men and boys who were led in singing and dancing via choregos. Okay, so returning to Eleutheriae. In the 6th century BCE, the city sought greater connection with the Attic Peninsula and its most prominent city, Athens. Eleutheriae wanted to establish closer ties with Athens by joining its polis, or what we might call a metropolitan area. So the citizens of Eleutheriae sent a procession to Athens with a statue of Dionysus at the center. Initially, the Athenians rejected the statue and thus the offer of Eleutheriae. But a plague struck down the Athenian population shortly thereafter, and the city leaders, believing it was the retribution of Dionysus, agreed to accept the Eleutherian petition. The Athenian leader, Pisistratus, dedicated a plot of land on the side of the Acropolis to this Dionysus and established a small temple there where celebrations to the god styled as Dionysus Eleutherios, or Dionysus the Liberator, could take place. About a century after all of that, the Athenian comic playwright Aristophanes lampooned the rural Dionysia in his play, The Acharnians, presenting it as a pastime of the overly traditional. In it, the lead character, Diacopolis, after learning he has inexplicably settled peace between Athens and Sparta, sets up a little rural Dionysia procession within his household, telling his daughter to be the basket bearer and his son, Xanthius, to act as one of the phallophori, saying, O Xanthius, walk behind the basket bearer, holding, you two, the phallus pole erect, and I'll bring up the rear and sing the hymn. Wife, watch me from the roof. Now then, proceed. It wasn't long before the Athenian citizens fully embraced the god within their midst. After all, who doesn't love a god dedicated to singing, dancing, and drinking? It was likely Pisistratus who, recognizing the popularity of the many rural Dionysia celebrations around the Athenian polis, established the city Dionysia in the middle of the 500s BCE. But rather than hold the festival during the planting month of Poseidon, as was common with the rural Dionysia, the city Dionysia was celebrated at the beginning of spring, which was when Athens reopened to trade after the winter season. This allowed many non-Greeks who had traveled to Athens to participate in what was essentially international commerce to also join in the, on the revelry. To be brief, the city Dionysia was huge. It involved the same processionals that were a feature of the many rural Dionysia, except that at the city Dionysia, it was the various metropolitan towns in and around Athens that sent processions to the festival. Think of it like a modern-day Mardi Gras with the neighborhoods of New Orleans sending floats and performers to the main parade. Athens acted as the central point of governance for all of these towns, organizing them into regions known as demes. The word deme or demos is the root of the word democracy. But this is a video on wine and theater, not wine and civics. On the first day of the city Dionysia, a procession carrying the statue of Dionysus Eleutherios marched to the temple on the southern slope of the Acropolis, recreating the events of the god's earlier transmission from Eleutheriae to Athens. Some of the most prominent members of the procession included the Choregoi. After the sacrifice of a bull, each Choregos led their choir in competitive performances of dithrams in a designated area between the hillside of the Acropolis and the temple of Dionysus, known as the Orchestra. In 534 BCE, a Choregos from the town of Icaria, a man named Thespis, led his chorus in a dithrambic ode, but instead of narrating the story at the heart of their song, Thespis took up the role of a character in that story, inventing from the dithrambic form a new type of celebratory performance for which he won the prize of Dionysus' preferred symbol, a goat. This goat song, as it came to be known, was so popular that the city Dionysia eventually set aside several days of the festival just for that type of performance. In ancient Greek, the word for goat song is tragoria, which has come down to us today as tragedy. 
Even after the ascension of tragic performances as the prominent feature of the city Dionysia, the Dithrams continued as an opening number for the festival. After the Dithrams, a different kind of procession occurred through the streets of Athens. It was during this procession that the wine casks were opened and everyone in the city partook in the mind and mood-altering power of Dionysus' gift to mankind. This part of the festival was known as the Komos, and though it served as the opening salvo of the true debauchery, it may be that the processionals involved some degree of formality, which may have come to shape the other form of performance that eventually made its way into the city Dionysia, a form known as komodia, or comedy. And though tragedy remained the featured form of drama in the city Dionysia, comedy still enjoyed a prominent place in the dramatic festival. Eventually, comedies would come to be considered the most celebrated part of a different festival dedicated to Dionysus, the Linnea. The last several days of the city Dionysia involved the dramatic competitions for tragedy and later also comedy. The winners of each competition would no doubt find glasses of wine raised in their honor for an entire year until the next city Dionysia. Greek culture of the period very much prized a kind of fame and recognition born from victory and competition. And through conquests and colonies, ancient Greek culture touched nearly every part of the Mediterranean world. As Stephen Charters points out in his book, Wine and Society, the social and cultural context of a drink, as well as planting in their own country, they took wines and vines to the Western Mediterranean. They were responsible for the very first vineyards in Southern Italy. And with nearly every Dionysian vineyard planted outside of Greece, there was a theater nearby where the works of Greek playwrights were performed to audiences of all types and sizes. Tragic playwrights like Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, as well as comic playwrights like Aristophanes and Menander, have had works survive through the centuries due to their fame as winners of the dramatic competitions. There are, of course, many other celebrated winners whose names we know, but whose plays, unfortunately, have not survived the centuries. And there are even countless others who played important roles in the rise of drama and theater as a part of the civic ceremonies and celebrations surrounding the god of wine, Dionysus. They are for us the progenitors of a kind of performance that still occasions people gathering together, imbibing a glass of fine wine and watching a show. To those ancient Greeks who invented theater out of celebrating the god of wine, we raise a glass. Cheers. Mm. Still so good. It's amazing. And good theater, too. I'm Kyle A. Thomas, the theater history professor. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss another one of the videos coming up in this series, Cheers and Booze.